Welcome to Created by Design. Today I have a number of things to show you, catch you up on what I've been working on. Um, hope I give you some new ideas and inspiration uh, for what you might be working on, be it knitting or crocheting or maybe not needlework at all. Maybe you're a baker. Um, I've been into making sourdough. I'm still working on perfecting that. I have a ways to go, but I'm enjoying it. So your hobby may not be what mine is, but it's always fun to hear from one another. Uh, in this segment, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Lois uh, Crow Weather Knitted Animals, um, catch you up on my puppy dog. Um, there's also going to be a segment on here about saltwater socks, a little bit about the sweet tomato heel. Some of these things you've heard me address before, but we're going to talk about them a little bit more. And then there's going to be a segment uh, about my daughter's backyard and what's happening to it, even though it's wintertime here in Oregon. There's still things happening outside. So I'm going to uh, try to make this short. Uh, or maybe at least shorter than some of them have been in the past. So, uh, so I'm going to catch you up on uh, a lot of little things that we've been working on. So the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, the puppy dog on the Knitted Animal Friends. Uh, this guy has one ear and that's what I want to talk to you about today is how I've changed up uh, the ear. And uh, he's not been steamed yet. Uh, he will smooth out. I'm kind of ex pleased with him. I'm actually working on uh, some pants for him. These are the little uh, britches I'm making for him. They have the little cable. I think maybe they're in the owl's pattern, maybe. Uh, but they're, they're going to be longer legs and they have a little cable going down the side. And then I'll make a shirt that has some orange in it so it ties it all together. But um, I want to show you what I've done with the ear. Uh, if you've watched me very long at all, you know I'm always trying to figure out ways not to have seams. I don't like to sew up seams. And so the foot has no seams in it as you've watched some of the past videos. Um, there is a little seam back here because whenever we do intarsia, uh, it's nigh on not impossible but you pretty much have to do it in the in the flat and so there is a little seam just in this section back here and that's what I where I use to stuff him even all the way up into his head because I knit the head right onto the body. I did do something a little different on uh, the dog besides the ear. I actually did like a toe cast on a figure eight on two needles. So there's no seam even on the bottom here. Um, and of course, you know, I knit the legs right in as I go. I knit the arms and the legs first, and then I start working on the body. So I have no seam starting down here. This is all done in the round. And then, of course, when I get up, like I was saying, to intarsia, then I'm knitting it, uh, knit a row, purl a row back and forth. And then once I get past the intarsia, I go back to knitting in the round and all the way up until I get to the intarsia place here on the head. And then there's a little seam in the back here, right where the intarsia is. And then right up here at the very top when the intarsia stops, I go back to knitting in the round. So there's no seam up here either. It's just how I prefer to do it. So what did I do to the ear? Well, I did a provisional cast on, so I had live stitches at the top because the ear is knitted in the flat. That's how the pattern book shows. And I'm actually on page 20 of her first book. And uh, But I figured with this ear, it would be very easy to do it in the round and eliminate having any seam. And by having live stitches up here, which is what you get when you cast on the provisional cast on, then I was just able to sew. I still had to sew it in, but I was sewing into a live stitch. And because you eliminate the cast on edge, and when you cast on, you, uh, you know, just a traditional cast on, 
you get a little bit of an extra ridge. And uh, so I wanted to see what it was like just to eliminate that. And you can still see the seam where it was sewn into, but it actually for me turned out a little smoother. And this ear works well. There's no, some of the ears have kind of a tuck in them and that would have been hard to do. But this ear was sewn on laying flat so I could just sew into those live stitches. So I'm gonna take just a half a second and talk to you. Um, many of you know what the provisional cast on is, but some of you don't. I'm getting questions from people that have not um, knitted a lot. And yes, you can go on YouTube and type in provisional cast on and you will see it, uh, see it done. But I'm gonna give a demonstration here of how I actually cast that on and get the ear started in the round. So I'm gonna switch my camera over so you can see that. And um, I think that that is all I need to talk about until I turn my camera around, so. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the provisional cast on, how I started this ear, so that uh, when I was through the e with knitting the ear, I would actually have some live stitches at the beginning. And I'm gonna show you exactly what that means. Uh, you can actually go to YouTube and type in provisional cast on and it's gonna, uh, give you some good demonstration. So I'm gonna do just a quick one here. So what do we have? We have some extra yarn that is a different color than what I'm actually knitting the ear in. This is the, for the ear, I'm gonna make it a solid brown ear. So I just made a quick little loop for my needle just to secure uh, my, my yarn. And now I'm gonna crochet on, uh, the amount of stitches that we need for the beginning of the year ear and so i'm on page 20 and it said ears make two well i've made the one and we're going to cast on 31 stitches so it's pretty simple i have this first little um, loop here on my needle and i don't want it pulled too tight because i need to be able to get in there get my crochet hook in there and then I want to make sure this yarn goes underneath my knitting needle. So this loop now is kind of big and that's just fine. I'm not going to count that as my first stitch. I'm going to make that my first, I'm going to count that as number one on here so you can see what I'm doing. Maybe I need to count it as number two because, yeah. So now I put my live yarn be underneath my knitting needle. Here's my crochet hook. I'm coming across the top of my knitting needle. I'm catching that and I'm pull, just crocheting. And I'm gonna bring this live yarn back under. I now have three stitches on there and I'm going to do that 31 times. Well, hopefully I can do it better than that. And you just don't want to pull your crochet tight because we're going to come back and knit in that. Now I've chosen, uh, it just was some extra, probably some sock yarn. It was what was laying close by. And um, I don't use the same yarn that I'm actually going to make the ear out of just because this is easier to um see the contrasting colors. So you can see this is pretty easy. Each time that I do the knit, it moves my live yarn on top of my knitting needle. So you just bring it to the back each time. And um, these are pretty loose on here. You don't want it so loose that, you know, they're, they're really huge, but I can, I'm holding it secure here with my thumb and, and uh, other fingers and I'm trying to do it slower I mean this actually you could sit and do it pretty fast but you're just um, gonna do this for 31 stitches 
Okay, I have my 31 stitches on there and I want to secure these last little cast on that I did here. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to knit a little chain of about, um, I don't know, eight stitches, just something to secure. And then when I get the ear done, I will know this is the end that if I pull this, it will unravel. So I'm gonna cut my yarn and just pull that loop through. And I'll have to come back and re uh, pull that through at the very, very end. But now this is my 31 stitches that I'm actually ready to knit with my yarn for the ear. And so when we look at page 20, uh, it says do the cast on and then purl a row. Well, I've actually knit a row that I call the cast on row. Because if you had casted that on, you would have had a row of these brown stitches. So I just knit straight across as if this was my cast on row. Because this green is going to go away when we get the ear all done. But when it goes away, it leaves me these live stitches that I'm actually knitting right now. So I'm gonna do one full row of knit. Okay, there's my 31 stitches knitted onto my needle. That's row, that's my cast on row, but I just knitted it. So the next row is purl on the wrong side. So this is my wrong side, so I'm in a purl. But at this point in time, I'm actually going to join in the round and start knitting in the round. She has you knit it flat, and then this would be folded over and seam up, which is perfectly fine to do it. I just, whenever I can eliminate a seam. So this was a seam that I was able to eliminate and by eliminating the actual cast on, it made it a smoother edge up here to knit the live stitch right into the side of the head. So I pick up a stitch along here and with the live stitch and it just made sewing that ear come out for me uh, and eliminated the, the cast on ridge that you get. Um, so that's just one little thing. I, I don't think that you need me to finish that ear because you simply follow every line and do just what it says, but you're just knitting in the round instead of going back and forth. So the purl row in the instructions is a knit row because you're going to join it in the round and you really wouldn't be purling. I'm going to join this, put half of the stitches on a second needle Use my little flexi flips. These work so great with these little critters. And uh, so I'll be putting half of these stitches on this needle and then take a third needle, which I will be knitting with, and I'll be totally knitting that ear in the round. So that's just one of the um, my, of my latest little how do I eliminate seams. There's no way you can eliminate everything uh, and you have to you know do a seam when you sew. Uh, the ear on the head, of course, but um, is this necessary? No, but uh, it's just the way I like to do it. So that's my catch up on my, my doggy. Um, next video, I should have it fully dressed and the eyes on and uh, I'm still enjoying making these little critters. So my couch is getting really full and uh, we're, we've got some more great grandchildren on the way. So uh, some of them will be leaving the home and go to a new home. So that's always fun. I decided to show you how I'm finishing off this ear. I've got it all finished, knitted it in the round. So my stitches now, I've taken the provisional cast off away and I've got my stitches on two needles and I've started knitting these two sets of stitches together. So these over here are my live stitches. This is what actually will get sewn into the dog's head.
So I do that just like you do a three needle bind off. Kind of hard for me to see this standing up and <laughs> making this happen. But you just go pick up the stitch off of your first needle, the stitch off of the second needle, and catch my yarn here and pull your yarn through and slip those stitches off the needle. And I'm going to go all the way across that way. And then this becomes what uh, gets actually sewn onto the dog's head. So this is my first ear that I've done this with. I think it actually might be a good solution uh, because it gets rid of that cast on row that is a little bulky to sew through. And by actually sewing and just picking up the actual going through the stitch itself to sew that on gives, I think, a little smoother uh, transition from the head onto the ear. So I just wanted to see you how I'm finishing that up. These stitches will all become one set of stitches instead of double when I get through uh, knitting across. So there's the uh, process. I might use this again. I think this might be a, a good solution for me. So experiment with that, see what you come up with. So this next segment uh, is going to be about saltwater socks. Okay, let's talk about socks. I just have to tell you, I am so loving uh, and having fun with making some saltwater socks. This is a terrific little book, uh, really inspired me uh, to make actually some slipper socks. Uh, I love making socks, but you know, when you're, when you're making socks um, out of fine sock yarn, like what I have started here, uh, that's a lot more stitches, takes a lot more time doing them. Um, and this is a much lighter weight, it's all wool sock yarn, and I love my homemade socks, I just have to tell you. This is the front side, I'm making kind of a little uh, lacy look. That stripe in the back is smooth, so the part that's gonna be on um, my sole, the bottom of my foot will be nice and smooth, but I have just a little, by just doing some purl stitches, makes this edge look a little ruffly, lacy, uh, just for the fun of it. So these are a lot more stitches. This is, and I really, this is John Arnock, um, his wool for socks. I'm loving this wool. I find that it holds its shape. It, the socks last longer, they fit well. I think this is probably one of the best sock yarns I've worked with. Uh, it's not quite as luxurious as some that have like um, cashmere in them. And those are great for wearing around the house, but a good sock in a boot or a shoe, uh, this yarn is really, really great. So back to my saltwater socks. This is a fun book. Newfoundland is uh, where these ladies are from and talking about the old patterns and the big heavy socks that they wore and do wear in the winter time. And uh, I'm in Oregon, we don't need such big heavy, heavy socks, but they're great for um, our hard, hard wood floors, hard surfaces to keep our feet warm. The older I get, the more I find that I like my feet to be warm. So the first pair, and I've shown you this already, this was my sample pair. And I have to tell you, I wear these all the time. And I'm really kind of hard on them. But this actually is an alpaca and wool. I've washed them so they've actually felted a little bit. And I think that's fantastic. Um, I would be careful in making them out of a yarn that felts because the person you give them to might just be tempted just to throw them in the wash machine and dryer. And then you're going to have extremely small socks. So these wash by hand and don't put them in the dryer because they naturally want to felt uh, on their own. And actually that's kind of the beauty about them. Uh, they're so comfortable and I wear them, like I say, all the time. So 
because this is in two colors, this is double thickness. So these, these are heavy. And now that they've felt it up a bit, they're just, they're terrific. But I would not, unless you knew the person you were <laughs> giving them that they want to do that maintenance. Uh, so I'm not making these for other people, but I am making socks for other people saltwater socks and so this is a washable wool uh, this is not going to felt and this is these are heavy and these will be great to wear I just love the brightness of the colors I love making them fun that's half of the fun everybody that sees them have said oh my goodness those are so much fun but they're slipper socks and um, they call them vamps in Newfoundland but they're just good old slipper socks and because this pair is uh, the two colors it it makes them very heavy but these you can throw in the wash machine and they could go in the dryer I just wouldn't do them at a at a real high heat and even these would be best if you just laid them flat to dry but they could take a little bit of a little bit of heat for sure um, so if you've watched some of my videos, you know that I'm a fan of this saltwater heel. And this is a pair of socks. I wear these all the time. And this saltwater heel, Sweet Tomato Heel by Kat Brody. This is the Sweet Tomato Heel. And you can see it's very, very smooth. And I thought, well, I love making this heel so much. I'm going to try making it in this heavier sock. And so... I did this pair first. This is just a little short top. And I did the two wedges. This fits my foot. but And I did a reinforced um, a heel. But, I mean, there's no comparison in cuteness, right? Because of what you can do with the color contrast. It, sweet tomato heel, it's hard to get that color contrast. Hard to do just these wedges in one color and then the body of the sock in another color. So my eye kept going back to the way the sweet saltwater pattern did. Here's another sock. I thought, well, I'll try it one more time. And the shape of this one actually is better. But let's face it, this is not nearly as cute <laughs> as this because you can get these color combinations and to me that's what makes these saltwater socks so cute is getting this you know bright colored heel having having the fun colors to me is what I'm really in, enjoying um, so I've bought up I don't know how many different colors, but I said to myself the other day, well, it's like when you color, you know, you have to have a lot of different colors in your Crayola box. Well, that's kind of when you're making a project like this and socks like this, you, you need a lot of different colors in your Crayola box because you never know what you might want to work with. So um, I went online, went to Webbs, W-E-B-B-S, found really the best price in this washable wool comes from Peru and it it's holding its shape making up really nicely here is another pair this is for men men's uh, slipper socks and a little more conservative I didn't use the bright orange on these but still fun that so the heel is the gray is in there and then the toe is in there so um, nice slipper socks and uh, I just they're fun because they go quickly uh, you actually do them a couple of times and you've you've got the pattern memorized and really picking up the stitches here in the gusset is really quite easy I'm knitting these on a size six for the cuff up here just the cast on and the first few rows of ribbing and then I go to a size seven uh, and I go to uh, back to the size six for the toe, just to make the toe nice and sturdy and, and structured. So I'm having a lot of fun with the saltwater socks. So I'll be making more of these. And I'm um, actually, I hope to have a bunch made so that the um, end of this 2023, there is a women's shelter um, with Union Gospel Mission and uh, it's a home for women uh, and if they have some children they can stay in the home like up to two years I think um, 
and so we just try to give gifts at Christmas time. So this I thought would be something fun for them to get in their Christmas bag, maybe some toasty warm socks. And so it gives me a purpose with my knitting. And yet these are quick projects so I can work on other things while I'm doing this. So that's my catch up uh, with saltwater socks. I encourage you to check them out, especially if if you enjoy making socks, but you want a sock that's quick to make versus the tiny little sock yarn. Because I make those too, but <laughs> it's fun to get a project done. And um, so that's, that's my sock story. And then I'm finishing up my um, baby blanket for our great newest um, grandchild that's to arrive sometime in April and I've got my strips all done here we have <clears throat> a little sheep I'm doing this with my friend Judy the other great grandma and uh, we've these strips they're bright it's a little girl and these strips all have to be uh, sewn together now and so we're getting together this next week and we'll be sewing our strips together by hand uh, finished getting the eyeballs in on the sheep the little detail and then we will be coming up with a way to quilt it it will have a flannel backing so that project's going to get done this week and so I hope to have pictures and show you next time and now we're going to transition to a catch up on what's happening in Carrie's backyard during the winter time. And uh, so I hope you enjoy uh, this next segment about Carrie's backyard and what's happening. Their home is being all remodeled inside and so she's working on the outside at the same time. They've got a lot of things, a lot of irons in the fire at one time, but it's all kind of fun to watch. So I hope you enjoy this next segment and um, we'll come back in a few minutes and say goodbye. Hi, this is Carrie. I am Linda's daughter, her youngest daughter, her favorite daughter kidding on that one uh, but I have been on a couple of other videos that that my mom has posted and the focus of my videos is what I'm doing in my backyard um, for those of you that are not aware uh, we live in Oregon and so this winter it's been fairly mild in terms of the temperatures we've, we've had some cold temperatures for our area and it's been very wet so I'm gonna give you an update on what I've been working on and I am heading in right now into uh, planning for a lot of seed starts. Uh, my goal is to have a yard full of flowers for cutting and then also a sizable area for some uh, vegetable gardening for my family and to share with family and friends. All right, so this does not look like much and it, it's a bit of a mess. So uh, this is one of two small portable greenhouses that I have put up. The second one is actually in that box that you see inside. Uh, the, these were very inexpensive. I watched for them on an Amazon Prime deal and got two of them. I think I, think I spent maybe $50 a piece on them. Um, I don't anticipate that they will last for a long, long time, um, but I didn't need really a, a big space for a greenhouse necessarily but I did need room so that I can have all of my seed starts uh, somewhere that I can keep an eye on and that can start to uh, be outside and, and get ready for the garden so my goal is to have two of these sitting side by side I have space for the next one and then um, I'll probably put some gravel down in previous videos I've talked about this um, black this black um, fabric that I've put down it's commercial grade pretty thick the water is able to drain through it but um, I am going to put some gravel down at some point in time right now you can see that I have some um, uh, wood that's really just helping to keep it braced down so that it doesn't blow away in the wind we've had some pretty windy weather these um, portable if you've not seen them before they do come with with tether strings but they're pretty lightweight so if you get a big gust of wind you really want to anchor down the bottom these are these are not heavy constructed they're they're all pull apart 
and um, the, you know I, I think that the drawback of them is that they are so lightweight that you do have to plan to really anchor them down really well. I could probably come in and get some some garden stakes and um, you know put around the bottom base so that it's anchored to the ground better and I'll probably do that but right now these uh, logs have been helpful through the windy uh, parts of the year. So this next box will get put together soon and it will give me plenty of space for a lot of seed starts, things that I can have out here that don't require um, like grow lights or heat mats. So I like the fact that it has a roll up door so that when the weather starts to get a little bit, a bit warmer, um, I'll be able to roll these up and get some airflow in as well as they've got these little portable windows on both sides that you can do the same thing with. So if I had to do it again, if you, if you decide that you wanna order these, I would suggest looking for uh, something that has maybe a little bit more of a flap at the end so that you can maybe down here where you can put a, a cinder block and really anchor them down around the edges and that will also help with um, wind. So that's the first thing. Now um, over here this looks just like a mess. Um, you can see our pod. We're going through some home home construction work repairs. Uh, but right here, this is frost cloth. And I'm gonna take it today and, and stretch it out and refold it. But what I've used this for is my ranunculus flowers that I'm gonna show you in a minute. If you, need so if you have something outside and you need to give it a little bit more warmth in the real cold temperatures where it's dipping below freezing, these, these work really well. And I have, this is a combination of three different very long, strips that I have been using when I've needed to. So I just have to get them a little bit more organized and folded up uh, so I can store them properly. Um, but they did work really well. Uh, it, you can still, they can get a little bit of moisture through them, but it does provide a little bit of extra heat for your young flowers. Um, what you want to look for though is depending on what part of the country you're in, if you get really, really low temperatures, there's different thicknesses of, of this um, fabric. It's really pretty thin for anybody that sews. It almost reminds me of interfacing, but um, there's different thicknesses and the, the different thicknesses will help hold in a certain amount of heat and give you extra warmth. So that's just something to be aware of if you've never used it before. This was my first time using it. And I am doing a number of things in my yard where, uh, in my garden, that I'm doing it for the first time and I'm learning as I go. So I found something very interesting. If you, if you look down below, I had a, a seed tray that I put in here. It was rainy and windy and it knocked over. And I happened to notice today, it's like, what is that green thing? Well, it happens to be one of the ranunculus corms that I did not think had originally made it and that it had not really um, developed properly. So I'm going to actually take it. I have no idea what color it is. So I may put it in the wrong bed, but I am going to um, plant this. And you can see that it, obviously it's got growth, but the, the little white uh, roots should still work. If it was growing here, it'll grow in the bed. So I will plant that a little bit later today. Um, now I'm going to walk over and I will show you, we're going to be taking and doing a lot of work back here, taking the patio out and replacing it at some point in time. But over here, we have a number of um, low garden beds that we put in and we repurposed wood. It's pressure treated, so I would never grow food in these beds, but they do work for flowers. But we repurposed wood that came from uh, a patio cover that we had on our patio back here. So we thought, well, with the price of lumber right now, it's a waste to just throw it away. So we made a number of different uh, beds that we can grow flowers in. So that will work great. Um, I did put some posts. You can see some some little posts around each of these beds. And the purpose of that is to help hold up some of that um, frost cloth that I lay over uh, each of the beds when I, when I need to hold in a little bit more warmth. So when I first posted my video, I was showing brand new corms that I had let sprout, pre-sprout, and then I put them in the ground. And this is the status of those. I planted these in the ground Oh, probably around Thanksgiving weekend, I believe. 
and uh, there, you know, you could see a little bit of green, but they've definitely been growing through the winter. I've been really um, surprised. I just was not really aware that so much could happen with certain um, flowers in cold weather, but these corms actually do well in, in cold weather. So um, these are ranunculus flowers. This bed, where I think they've probably grown the most at this point, these are a salmon color when they are fully grown. And I would say, Overall, um, I had really good germination of the corms in the ground, which is not the case if you look at this second bed. You know, you definitely see growth, but but there are definitely spots where uh, the corms did not uh, germinate all the way, and that might be due to if they were in the pre-sprouting process. You know, perhaps they um, got too moist and they experienced rot. I also noticed right here, I will plant this down a little bit more because this is actually growing on the surface of the soil. This is actually, you can see the corn, um, all that, that brown, and then you can see the, the sprouts that are, the, the um, roots that are coming out of it. But I will, you know, I will go ahead and cover that up a little bit so that, that is better protected. Um, so that's interesting that that happened. That may have been as a result of the friendly squirrels that we have on our property, so I don't know. But anyways, you can see that those did not germinate all the way. However, coming down here, I think we have some additional things happening, you know? So how interesting that these were planted at the same time. There's a bunch of growth here, but now I've got a little bit of growth happening here. And then as I look a little bit further down, I have a little bit more here. So perhaps I will have a better result than I thought I was going to. Uh, but that's happening. That's what's happening right now in the ranunculus uh, beds. I have one more over here and they're doing pretty well. I think I got a pretty good germination rate off of these. So I'm so far I'm very very pleased with what's going on and as a first time grower of this particular kind of flower um, I'm pretty I'm pretty pleased. I can also tell that spring is near because I'm seeing weeds. I see it right there so I'll have to go through and start tending to the weeds in my garden. Um, what else can I show you? So here's an example of a bed that has not been prepped yet and I've got two smaller beds as well. I'm planning on putting down a thick layer of cardboard in each of these beds that'll just cover up those weeds that are coming and then I'll fill in over the top with uh, garden soil. And these beds will also have some type of flower in them and then these flower the ranunculus what i'm planning on doing with these beds is repurposing them for a different kind of flower after these are all done blooming and being harvested uh, these will probably be done by may and then i'll be able to take the corms out i do want to go through the process of trying to save the corms so that i have um you know not having to buy new things every year. I'm trying to do this very economically. And so this will be a really good test for me to see if I can harvest, you know, take the corms out, dig them up. I should be able to divide them and then save them until next year and start them again in the fall with the pre-sprouting process. But I will be able to repurpose these beds and use them for different, different flowers that I'm gonna be growing. And I have a lot of them. I have big plans and I'm hoping they all turn out exactly the way that I want. So, um, I have not laid down, obviously, wood chips. I am planning on bringing in wood chips and putting them down wherever you see this garden fabric. Um, I'm so glad that I had it during this rainy season because I would have had an incredible mess of mud out here. I already have different sections uh, of my yard that will ultimately be um, landscaped very differently. Um, but I was glad that around around my garden beds that I've been actively working with this winter that I've had this garden fabric. It was a great investment. It'll be able to stay here for a long, long time. And um, it saved a lot of mud in my yard. Um, I did plant a number of daffodils and tulips and I'm seeing new growth coming up. So that's exciting. I started seeing that this week. I, I have lost track of how many bulbs that I've planted in my yard um, but there's a number of them so I'm excited about that this was a re uh, transplanted um, hydrangea from my front yard and I can already see some new well it's not showing up very well but I am seeing some new growth on there 
I need to get better at my camera capabilities, but there is new growth. Super excited there. So clearly I did not kill my hydrangea. So win for me. Um, this bed will be all vegetables and I already see some weeds coming up. So I'll have to start doing weed maintenance. And over here, again, weeds, hate weeds, but they are part of the process. Over here, I put in some garlic and they're doing really well. Um, this is called Turban Blossom. So these are all Turban Blossom and that'll be exciting to have. I think I planted a total of 130 approximately garlic um, cloves in the fall around September, end of September, and that's their growth so far. Now, if I continue walking over right here, we see more pop-up of daffodils. I'm sure these are the daffodils at this point. I think these are all daffodils that I'm seeing before um, I would be seeing tulips. These are garden beds that I need to, that I'm in the process of amending. And you're probably saying, what is all of that white stuff? Well, I happen to shred a lot of my paperwork and I, you know, bills and envelopes and stuff. And I basically have put them in my garden bed to help put brown matter in my garden bed and break that down, put some leaves in, and these will be food bins over here can't really tell what's happening but I'll share with you this is this is all garlic I repurposed some cinder blocks that we had in our yard and I've covered I covered it in an emergency because we were going to be out of town and the squirrels were wanting to get at the garlic bulbs and so I'm going to take off this uh, bed uh, flower bin and it'll go next to this other one over here and we'll lay down cardboard and, and use these for flowers as well. But I put chicken wire over here to protect the garlic from the squirrels. And now with the weather starting to warm up a little bit over the last couple of weeks, this particular bed was planted at the same exact time as the other garlic I was just showing you. But this is what this bed looks like. So different area of the yard, different growing conditions, and they're, they're um, not growing as fast, but they all seem to be doing pretty well. Everywhere I know that I planted, it looks like they're all, they're all gonna grow and hopefully do really, really well. So I think there's probably four different varieties of garlic. These are all organic garlic. I ordered them from Hood River Garlic here in Oregon, and I've used them before and they have, they have a great product. Uh, they have a website if you're interested in, in ordering from them, Hood River Garlic, and you can pre-order and uh, they've got just a great product. So anyways, that is an update on what is happening in my garden. And sorry about the fingerprints. I hope you, I enjoyed. Hope you enjoyed that segment with Carrie and what's happening in her backyard. It was just a quick catch up. Have a good day. Please hit like and share if you are enjoying uh, these episodes. I'm enjoying doing them. So thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye now.